Thank you very much, Denise. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presumptuous and say welcome to Scotland. Um, for those of you who know Scotland, there is tremendous rivalry between where we are now, Glasgow, and my home city of Edinburgh. So through gritted teeth, I'll even say welcome to Glasgow. Um, I've got um, perhaps 20, 25 minutes just to try and um, give you a backdrop of what's happening globally in terms of impact on the nursing workforce. And then within that also locate what's happening uh, in the UK and really conclude by setting out some of what I regard as the key issues that need to be bundled together uh, as solutions if we're really going to address uh, what, in my experience, is the, the nearest that, that nursing has had to um, an existential crisis in the UK for all the time I've been involved. And I'm very much, very deliberately taking an international perspective because i uh, really very pleased that the RCN has come back into the International Council of Nurses. I think it can add tremendous weight to deliberations within ICN, but um, we also need to be humble enough to realize that we can also learn a lot from what's going on in other countries. So that will be one of my themes also. So in terms of um, structure, what I'm, I'm going to cover, I'm, I'm going to do the public speaking 101 error. I'm going to give you the solution before I start talking about what the problems are. But I think it's important to do that because I think otherwise we run the risk of being in an endless cycle of hearing what the problems are um, and some of them are becoming more pronounced but we need to get beyond that. We need to cut that cycle and get to what we can do about it. Um, picking up on the global backdrop, particularly in regards to the pandemic and the impact it's had on the nursing workforce, then look a bit more in detail at uh, the UK in an international context and then conclude with um, a, a blueprint uh, in loose terms for how we can address the big challenges. Some of what I'm um, drawing from is very much um, coming from this report, which I co-authored, which uh, was published by the International Council of Nurses earlier this year. Uh, it sets out the global challenges and uh, it's available free online if you want to have a look at it. I'll also give you the, the link at the end. Uh, so, um, I'm giving you the solution at the beginning of my presentation. There is um, an audience quiz attached. So here's um, a report setting out how to solve nursing shortages. And um, it sets out some of the perhaps by now predictable solutions. Looking at skill mix changes, improving retention, looking at pay, looking at incentives, pension, workload, and trying to track returners back, those who've got qualifications but not in the workforce now. So, um, which year do you think this report came out? Which country? Uh, is this the recently published Scottish Integrated Workforce Plan? Is this the Any Day Now Health Education England framework, which we're all excitedly waiting for. It's from 1945. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a cheap trick, but it's my, my entry point in the sense that it's easy to come up with solutions and we've been doing it repeatedly over the years. Uh, some of the underlying challenges have not really changed that much. They're still there. They've been exacerbated, I think, by the pandemic. They've been exacerbated by governments who don't listen. Um, but my starting point really is to recognize that we need more than shopping lists of solutions. We need to get to implementation and funding. So um, global backdrop, very quickly, just to get you all framed where we are in the bigger picture. The State of the World's Nursing Report, which was published uh, early 2020, is the first time there's been a, a global report on what the nursing workforce looked like. It was published by WHO. I've just picked out a few of the key messages that, that emerged. Around about 27, 28 million nurses are in, in the world. 90% female. 
shortage at that time estimated somewhere around 6 million and most of those shortages predictably in lower income countries. So we are in a country which is a registered population of almost 800,000 so we're big in terms of compared with many other countries but uh, when you look at the scale of the shortage for example uh, it, it diminishes any individual country's workforce. About one in six of nurses currently in employment will retire sometime in the next 10 years. That's mainly in high income countries such as the UK. We have already existing and increasingly uh, a challenge of how we're going to replace the many nurses who are going to retire in the next few years, particularly in community nursing, which has the oldest age profile. And some of the issues around retirement have been exacerbated by the pandemic, so we need to take account of that also. High income countries graduate on average about three times as many nurses as do low income countries. So they are able to invest more in training for the future. And about one in eight nurses working around the world is working in a country that they weren't trained or born in. There's huge and increasing mobility of nurses around the world. And I'm, I'll talk a bit more about this later. The UK is one of the major drivers of nurse mobility at the moment. In fact, it, it may be the major driver, and I'm going to come back to that. So we came into the pandemic with the State of the World's Nursing, which essentially, because it was published at the beginning of 2020, painted the picture of the workforce globally before the pandemic hit. And what we're now seeing if in every country is the impact of the pandemic on the nursing workforce. And just very quickly to summarize, you can see some of the issues there, some of which were nicely picked up this morning in the, the new RCN report on nurses at the front line, but we're looking at uh, more burnt out nurses, absence, higher rates of leaving, uh, demand to step down in terms of hours or in terms of less exhausting areas to work in, and more looking at retirement, including early retirement. This is not specifically a UK picture I'm painting, this is, this is global. Those who remain are having to deal with more stress. And we're also seeing very clearly the connection between burnout of nurses and the impact of that burnout on patient care and on organizations, as well as the impact on the nurses themselves. So there's a clear link to poorer quality of care, uh, lower satisfaction of patients and reduced productivity. So it knocks on into patient care quality as well. And if you look at how organizations and systems are responding to nurse burnout, unfortunately, in many cases, the emphasis is, is being put on the, the nurse to sort it out, to deal with it, uh, to be resilient, to look at an app that somehow is going to improve safe staffing. We need to recognize that may be part of what we need, but the real onus here, the duty of care, is on systems and employers to ensure that the situation they put nurses into is dealt with and addressed. This is not something that is a one-by-one, nurse-by-nurse solution. Finally, we've got long COVID. We don't really know yet how that's going to imp impact and play out. It will increase demand for care and demand for nurses. It will impact on many nurses as well. As yet, it's an unknown, but one that will become increasingly prominent, I think, over the next five to 10 years. So, um, pandemic meant increased demand for care. Pandemic has meant in many countries problems with nurse supply, turnover up, absenteeism up, retirement up. And what we're seeing is that di different countries came into the pandemic at different levels of preparedness. England had about 40,000 nurse vacancies before the pandemic. 
England has brought more nurses into the system, but it still has about 40,000 vacancies because it's not been able to ramp up and fill those vacancies quickly enough over the, the two years since the pandemic be began. You can look at other countries which are exhibiting the same sort of issues around current shortages, projected increased shortages. And these countries, these high income countries, are all talking about or doing international recruitment now. It's the way that they're going to fill the vacancies most quickly. Um, I'm going to come back to that in terms of where the UK fits in, but we need to be aware that pandemic related demand is going to drive up international recruitment even more than it has in the last year or so. So that's the pandemic background. What I'm going to do now in three or four slides is just begin to pick out where the UK figures in the bigger picture. And I'm using data from the OECD, which publishes annual information on, on each country. It's 32, 33 high income countries around the world, plus some other countries that are aspirational members of OECD. And what I'll do with each graph, and here's the first one, um, you're not going to be tested at the end, so don't worry about trying to work out which country is where. The average across OECD is red, uh, and the UK is that kind of golden yellow color. So uh, first graphic, nurse per population. Um, a reasonably good indicator of access and availability of nurses. How many nurses roughly are there per population? UK, just below OECD average, and you can point to other countries in Europe which have many more nurses per population. And there's a, a thread running through my presentation here, which is the countries that the UK relates to in terms of comparisons, uh, the countries that we probably connect with most tend to be better off than we are for nurses. Um, and that's a question that we need to think about why. So um, nurse graduates per population per 100,000. Again, OECD data. Uh, and there's uh, the UK, the, the yellowish golden column. We're graduating round about 30 nurses per 100,000 population. That's half the number of the United States graduates and a third the level of graduation in Australia. The United States has doubled the number of graduates it has across a 10 year period. We're slightly above where we were 10 years ago, but not really making much progress. That is a question right there. Why are we so low? Why have we been so low for so long compared to countries we would aspire to? And finally, uh, share of foreign trained nurses. What is the proportion of nurses working in the workforce who have been trained in other countries? And we're up there near the top, around about 15% of nurses working in the UK have been trained elsewhere. Uh, if you look at New Zealand right at the top, um, it's a country no bigger than Scotland. And the reason it is so reliant on international recruitment is that Australia recruits its nurses and it has to go elsewhere to fill the vacancies created by the outflow. So it's a small country, but very vulnerable because of that. Finally, pay. Um, pay is an intractable issue. It's an important issue. I'll come back to it again. If we look at this graph, which uses the what's called purchasing power parity, so it's trying to create a comparison that is, that is really meaningful. UK hospital nurses earnings just below OECD average and way below uh, countries that we would again aspire to like United States, Belgium, Australia, etc. So uh, what does the report card look like overall across those four indicators? Uh, well below average nurse per population very much below average on nurse graduates per population, just below average on earnings, and 
markedly above average on international recruitment. So that's four dimensions that we all need to think about that are all important, but it's locating us in a particular place. We are very reliant on international recruitment. Arguably, we are not training enough nurses ourselves. We pay, could do better, might be the, the way the report card is being marked. So, those were point in time measures. They don't tell us what the trends are or what's happening. So I'm just gonna pick up on a couple of trend issues. Um, this is the UCAS data. The, the, the red line is applicants to university undergraduate nursing across roughly the last 10 years. The green line is those who have been accepted. Uh, there was a fantastic amount of coverage of the fact that the number of accepted applicants had gone up in the first year of the pandemic and that green line shows that uptick uh, one year ago but that has now virtually tailed off. What I'd like you to think about is that for every year across the period of that graph there have been 10, 12, 15, 20,000 potential applicants to nurse education who weren't accepted for whatever reason. And I think we know some of the reasons, capacity, uh, clinical placement issues are becoming more pronounced, funding clearly, but there's a lost opportunity there. So we flip now to international recruitment. Uh, this is data from Nursing Midwifery Council the period since 1990, uh, I've collated the data. The red part of the column, international nurses from non-EU countries. The blue part of the column, international nurses registering from the EU. And we are, in the most recent year, back up to historically unprecedented levels. We've never been here before in terms of the level of nurses, and they're nearly all being recruited from outside of Europe, from low or lower middle income countries. And some of them are on what is called the red list. Those are countries which the UK and others have agreed not to actively recruit from because of potential damage. There are 3,000 nurses came onto the register this year from Nigeria. Nigeria is on the red list. So, that raises questions that need more detailed responses than we have currently. There is a risk here that we are solving our own shortages by creating potential damage in other health systems. If you collate that with the numbers coming from domestic education in the UK, that's the percentage. The blue is those who've come from domestic education, the red from international. As you can see, we had a, a, a peak of international recruitment around about 2000, dropped away down, and it's really picking up very heavily now. And pay, uh, trends in pay. The red line, which is at the lowest level there, shows the trend in uh, nurses' earnings in the UK across the last 10 years or so. Compares it with comparator countries in the OECD, like New Zealand, Australia, USA, and uh, what you can see there is the UK has fallen behind a bit, and that's particularly because of the pay freeze, which was for seven years, which essentially means that beyond it and coming back into uh, the review body system, uh, there is a lot of pressure to catch up, and there's now a lot of pressure to compensate for very high inflation. And that puts us in a very challenging position this year in terms of what government thinks it can afford versus what nurses think they need. And um, I don't think it's likely to have a happy ending. So I've just got two final slides and then hopefully some time for questions. This slide is taken straight from that ICN report that I mentioned earlier. So this is a kind of glo global summary of the evidence on what works, what can you implement to improve retention. And 
the uh, left-hand column is the kind of pre-pandemic issues. The right-hand column are ones that have come through because of the pandemic. And I'm not going to dwell in any detail on those. If you look at the left-hand column and you scroll through them, there's nothing there that's new that you haven't heard of before. There's nothing particularly innovative. But my key point is the one I made right at the beginning. It's there isn't a magic bullet. There isn't a solution that no one has ever thought of before. If we're going to coherently address the underlying challenges in the nursing workforce in the UK, we need to recognize that it's not just a point of cherry picking one or two of these solutions, trying them out, piloting them, going back, etc., etc. We've got to recognize that probably we need to be doing all of these or at least the majority of them. And we need to be doing them in a coordinated fashion, underpinned by a national plan and with funding. So my final slide, just to kind of summarize what I think are the, the key issues to consider. And I've got brackets here that there are four UK governments. They must be front and center in leading on this. They're the ones who create the policy environment they're the ones who decide how much to fund healthcare. Healthcare is labor intensive. If you're funding healthcare, you've got to be thinking about how you're going to be funding the pay and training of those in the workforce. And you've also got to recognize that as governments, you are coordinating, you're leading other stakeholders. The RCN is a big stakeholder. And the other thing to factor in here is that we tend to talk about government as though it's monolithic. The Ministry of Health will have one idea, perhaps, about what to do, which might be different from number 10, if we're talking about England, which is probably going to be different from what the Treasury thinks it can afford. And too often, the Treasury is the ghost at the bargaining table. It's not there, but it's actually the biggest influence on the overall decisions. So, when the RCN and nursing is deciding how to best put forward and advocate for improved pay, demonstrating the value of nursing, it's not the Ministry of Health that you need to impress, it's the Treasury. And it's the population out there because they're the ones who vote the politicians and it's the politicians who put pressure on Treasury. So there's a, there's a broad range of potential advocacy and influencing there, but it's certainly not just about sitting across the table from the Ministry of Health. If we look down the list, safe staffing, this is critical. If we don't get safe staffing right, we can't build on it and get the other solutions. And three of the four UK countries have made some progress in setting out approaches which have some sort of national endorsement. They've not moved as quickly as people would have hoped because of the pandemic, but England has got to catch up. England has still not got a nationally approved approach or system or systems in place. That's why it's got 40,000 vacancies. The other issues there, impact assessment. We are very poor at knowing what's actually happening to nurses in particular organizations. We've got surveys that are national level, but they're not detailed enough to tell us what's going on in Glasgow Health Board versus Cornwall. Uh, there are underlying issues that are the same, but there are particular local or organizational drivers that need to be taken account of as well. Bundle of issues around retention, pay, equal opportunities, get rid of discrimination, again, critical to overall dealing with the problem. And then if you look down at the, the final three I put there, enabling nurses to contribute at their most advanced level, career structures that encourage, reward. The problem at the moment is that many advanced practice nurse posts are being reduced in salary, and that's giving the wrong message very clearly. Monitor self-sufficiency. Are we comfortable that we train a third the level of nurses as Australia do? Are we comfortable that we are and have been historically so heavily reliant on recruiting nurses from other countries. At the very least, we need to improve our ability to monitor 
exactly what's going on. That NMC data I showed you, 3,000 Nigerian nurses have registered. We don't know where they're working. Are they working in the NHS? Are they working in the private sector? Are they even working at all? We don't know. Uh, we need to get to that point so we can have a proper informed debate about what self-sufficiency might look like and how far do we want to try and go to attain it. And finally, predictably, fully funded national plan. Um, England in particular has stuttered along without a fully set out national workforce plan or strategy for the NHS um, for longer than I care to remember. Um, we're promised that this will be happening. Hopefully it will, and hopefully it will soon, but it's got to engage with other st stakeholders in development, such as the RCN, so that it has relevance when it's finally uh, there on paper and then becomes a reality through implementation. That's a kind of low-key Scottish Aberdonian ending to my presentation, but I, I'm very clear that the situation we're in now, nursing is in now, is the most challenging it's been since I've been involved. And when we compare what's happening here to high-income comparator countries, we don't look that good at the moment in terms of a sustained approach or proper funding. And that's where we need to get quickly, I think, if we're going to address these underlying challenges. Thanks very much. James, did you say you'd answer? Is it Jim or James? Uh, either. You answer to either? Yeah. All right then. Mr. Buchan. Um, <laughs> it's actually a professor. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Professor Jim James Buchan. Um, I think you said you'd take a couple of questions, is that correct? Sure, yeah, happy Thank to you. do that. Thank you very much. So, um, um, I think what we'll do is, I think we'll bring people here because I can't, there's no list there. So if anybody wants to, uh, put your hand up and we'll bring, so I've got somebody over here. Can we have a roving mic here? And then we'll have, if you come up here to the procedural, Mike, yeah, come on, yeah. If you both come there, yeah. Thank you very much. Right, so that's enough people. Okay, thank you. If you'd like to introduce yourself, thank you. Sure. Uh, ben Thomas, uh, Mental Health uh, Nursing Forum. Voting member, thank you very much. I've seen you for a long time, and really yeah. good to see you. Uh, my question is a very simple question, really. This morning, the Secretary of State for Health said that by the next election, uh, we will have an extra 50,000 nurses. Mm. Um, my question is, should we believe him? <laughs> so, th th there's, actually, there's actually two questions there. Will we... we England meet the 50k target um, and should I believe everything that a health minister tells me? <laughs> um, I'll park the second one. The first one, I think um, given the way the, the 50k target was calibrated, there's a good chance that it will be met and uh, I'll qualify that in two very important ways. It's a 50k target that doesn't relate to planning. It's not necessarily going to be the right nurses with the right skills in the right place. In fact, it's almost, I think, uh, going to be quite the opposite um, because the reason it will be met, if it is met, is high level active international recruitment, 10, 15, 20,000 a year at the moment, uh, which tend to be uh, very well skilled hospital based nurses generally speaking, or care of the elderly. So that will be the conduit for the international flows. Uh, community nursing, mental health nursing, areas which in learning disabilities, which have the highest vacancy rates, are probably least open to international recruitment as a solution. So 50K target met, is it the right target? No. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next. Um, Alexander Morrell, I'm from London, non-voting member. Thank you for your talk. I've studied the, a lot of the stats. I'm beginning to think UK is not, not a high-income country, but middle-income. Mm. But what I really wanted to ask you, are there any countries that are really doing a good job with retaining nurses as well as training them? Because you mentioned Australia, but, I, but are there any other countries that you'd recommend in terms of the... And, and in fact, there's a stall here trying to get British nurses to go to Australia, which yeah. I think is really funny. But um, anyway, um, so what, where, are good, where are examples of really good practice? Because yeah. I'm thinking a country like Finland seems to be doing very well, yeah. but yeah. maybe not a good comparison. Thank you. Um, it's a tricky one because you, you, you pick a country and then the day after the nurses go on strike. Um, it's at, Finland nurses have been on strike lately. Finland is regarded as a good place, usually but um, it's having some challenges. Australia, I lived in Melbourne for five years. I've come back, so retention doesn't always work. Um, but it's, it's well-paid um, and it's got good career structures. Uh, it has mandatory nurse ratios in some of the states, which nurses love, and that gives them a, a kind of certainty about staffing levels. And uh, a couple of other states are, are moving that way at the moment. Uh, whereas one that isn't New South Wales, there is discussions of strikes there. So I think we can look at um, Scandinavia as, as a good place to look for examples of how nursing can be treated uh, and can be enabled to contribute at an advanced level. Less so further south in Europe. Thanks. Next. Sorry, guys. Andrea Spiropoulos, I'm a member for JKL. I was really interested in the figures, Professor Buchan, because um, I know that in, on, in our country, we have over 640,000 nurses on the register, but the reality is that a lot of those nurses are not in clinical practice daily. They are either in management roles or in education or in private sector supervising. And it doesn't seem um, to be possible to get a clear feel of how many nurses we actually have working in acute clinical practice and community, etc. Those statistics aren't there, so they're so crude, they don't help. And the other thing that you mentioned, so I, I wanted to know, have you got any suggestions as to how we tackle that? And the other thing that you mentioned was that nursing policy and the driver has to be through the Treasury. And how do you suggest that the RCN does that? Because the paymaster has a vested interest in keeping nurses' pay low. Mm. And until we shift that, we will lose nursing staff. Mm. So I, I'll, I'll try and respond relatively quickly to you. There's two different questions. The data question, I think if you, uh, if you look at the detailed NHS statistics, ones that aren't necessarily published but available, you can aggregate up from the four UK countries, get a reasonably good picture of how many nurses are working in different care environments. You can match that against the NMC register and that gives you a sense of participation rate in the NHS. We're much less clear about the number of nurses working in private sector, nursing homes, etc. Um, and that is one of the, the critical gaps in terms of proper workforce planning that we have at the moment. Second question, how do you influence Treasury? Um, I, I alluded to that slightly in my presentation. I think there's two, probably three ways of doing it. One is putting forward the arguments about investment in nursing and the payback in economic terms that that will create. Improved population health means improved economy if they, if they can understand that connection, they're more likely to be persuaded. Secondly, it's obviously not just addressing them directly, but it's getting pressure on them via politicians, mem members of parliament. And, and thirdly, I think it's working with other stakeholders. Too often, I think nursing tries to do this on its own. You need to be working with patients groups, public at large, media. Simple, strong arguments repeated often enough, um, which is really how the current government does things. So, you know, listen and learn. Don't necessarily do. 
I take three more questions, and um, so the next three people, um, if they, um, could you make them nice and quick? One question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charlotte Collins from Essex branch, and I'm on the Eastern Board. Um, I'm a very passionate recruitment and retention nurse, and for me, the biggest barrier, I suppose, I'm trying to articulate this well, so really big apologies if I don't. Um, but the biggest problem I face when I am recruiting is the amount of applicants from red list countries. You don't necessarily know um, that they are from a red list country on shortlisting when they apply directly. Mm. And it could prove an unconscious bias should I know, um, because I might then um, refuse to accept somebody that is very qualified to do the job. What advice do you give to employers on tackling um, or reducing the amount of red list nations mm. that we recruit from? I think we've got to differentiate between um, recruiting and employing nurses who are already in the country or, and or who uh, on their own volition make the case for applying. That, uh, that is not at the moment regarded as uh, red list because red list is about active recruitment by the employing country. So if the nurses are already in the country or they make their own attempt to apply for a job, that should be okay. Thanks. Thank you, Josiah Okishala from Nigeria, my first time in the Congress. Um, my question is, uh, it's still based on the red list recruitment and the, um, hmm. filling the gap for the shortage here from low and middle income countries. Um, there seems to be two school of thoughts. Those who are, we regard as a pessimist, who see the all and the donors, and the optimist, who see the donuts rather than the whole. So some of us are beginning to argue that instead of looking at the brain drain agenda, why not begin to consider the brain gain solution? Yeah. Yeah. So is there a way that the Royal College of Nursing can begin to look at innovations and creativity that can help low and middle income countries begin to focus on the brain gain benefits of shuttling off the shortage here with nurses from low and middle income countries while we work on focusing on replacing those shortages to the brain gain agenda. Mm. Is there any way the Royal College of Nursing can create probably a space for African leaders mm. right here in the UK who can begin to look at that innovative solution and begin to work on it to prefer um, mm. bigger solutions to the problem. Sure. Um, I won't presume to respond on behalf of the RCN, but you, your question is right at the, the core of this issue, brain gain or brain drain. Um, I think we've got to recognise the tremendous contribution that international nurses make in the UK. If we didn't have them, the system wouldn't work. But what we have got to do is understand the impact of our actions. And that's why there is in place a code of conduct and there is a red list. And as I said to the, the previous questioner, the emphasis is on active recruitment from the countries on the red list rather than, it doesn't prevent individuals moving, for example. So I think we need to be clear that there is still a conduit, an ability for individual nurses to come. I think in terms of how the process happens, and I'll, I'll presume to respond from the RCN on this one, I think there's much more can be done to ensure that the recruitment process is both ethical and effective. And we read repeatedly of nurses being recruited from other countries who um, are not well treated, are not properly informed about their pay or their work location or their hours or how much it's going to cost if they, if they want to break a contract. So I think there's a, uh, a role there which the, I know the RCN is already playing in, but if we take my point earlier on that the volume of this recruitment is going to increase, not just in the UK but elsewhere, I think we need to be revisiting what we're doing in terms of those elements of recruitment to ensure that they are ethical and they are effective. 
The brain gain argument is very persuasive, which is um, nurses come, they spend a few years, they learn, they go back and they contribute in, in their home country. The evidence is not there in great detail that that, ha that happens at scale. Usually nurses move and they don't move back. In some countries, if they move back, their contribution and qualifications earned in other countries are not recognized. So there are barriers to be looked at there. Fundamental underlying issue here is that if the UK could get better at training its own and retaining its own, it would put less pressure on other countries, just as would the government in Nigeria or Kenya or Uganda. If it got better at retaining its nurses and recognizing in some countries, for example, there are many unemployed nurses, that that needs to be fixed as well. So it's, it's simple in, until you look at the issues and the dynamics at play. And I think what we've got to do is focus on the UK impact and footprint and be very clear that we're doing all we can to be ethical as well as effective. And our last question. Thank you, Mr. Professor. Um, we appreciate your speech. My name is Tola Adiojo. I'm a voting member of Amshire Branch. I just observed when you are delivering your speech that you mentioned about some certain countries that are on red list, and you said certain countries, but you are only hammering on Nigeria. I want to, I want to find out that why are you mentioning Nigeria? And you did it twice, which is a little bit overwhelming. And I just want you to know that you need, when you are making a speech like sure. this. You need yeah. to be incorporative and involve other countries as okay. well. If you have mentioned other countries, it could have been acceptable. Thank you. Uh, the, reason, the reason I mentioned Nigeria twice was that uh, in the last 12 months, according to the NMC data, the country on the red list, which had the biggest number of nurses registering in the UK by far, was Nigeria with 3,000 nurses. Ghana was next, I think, with about one and a half thousand. So I'm not isolating or identifying Nigeria for any other reason than it is at the moment the most obvious red list country, which has a registration connection to the UK register. Thank you. So um, can we put our hands together to thank Professor James Buchan for his um, presentation? Thank you.